Refreshments in the corner. Don't forget the tip jar. We've got the recycling bins by each door.
Start replacing your bulbs, your, your incandescent bulbs with LED bulbs, even if they have not burned out. Um, now, I'm going to pass a couple of clipboards around. The top sheet is asking you to volunteer to uh, stand at a table and tell people about Sierra Club. So if you uh, have, have been around a while, please pay attention to that and sign up if you can for some of these events that are coming up. And the second page is the content of the conservation update email that I'm about to send out that lists six things that you can do for conservation uh, over the next month. And I encourage you to pay attention to that. Consider signing up for on that email list. Uh, or take a picture of these items and, and go do the ones that you can. Uh, for instance, we have, uh, there is uh, Solar United Neighbors, uh, a, a nonprofit in Dallas, is organizing co-ops for installing solar. And if you have considered solar panels on your roof, uh, they are will likely uh, have the best deal for you, and uh, you might go to their website and express your interest. Um, Texas Trees Foundation has several tree plantings coming up, and I have the dates listed here and the uh, link where you can find out the details about those events. Uh, on March 22nd, the, uh, the musical group Montopolis will perform at Texas Theater uh, a production called The Living Coast, which is uh, a combination of photography and video and live music and storytelling I've seen another production by Montopolis. It's breathtaking. It's like taking a tour of the Gulf. This I expect it to be like taking a tour of the Gulf Coast without expending any carbon. Uh, the uh, the tickets are. I have the link on here that will take you to where you can get the tickets, and I. I think they're they're twenty dollars each, um, which is a low price for that group. Cedar Valley Co uh, Community College. If you live in the southern part of Dallas County, uh, in particular, or have interests there, Cedar Valley Community College is going to have a. Uh, roundtable discussion on April 17th. Uh, it's free. They'll feed you breakfast and lunch, and you get to provide your input about what should be developed for uh, that part of the county, economic development for that part of the county. Um, So, um, that's what I have for now. Did you mention on the, on the sign-up sheet, there are several opportunities to talk to kids in, in around 10 years of age. Uh, Girl Scout troop, fifth grade class, are they on there? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're looking. I'm sorry, I dropped the ball on that. We've had some requests for, uh, for someone to come and speak to youngsters, and most of our speakers are not equipped to do that. So if that is We're way too advanced for 10-year-olds. <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or we're not retired and we're going to respect. Yeah. Um, so, so if that is a possibility for you, would you please come
come, come get my attention. And kids that age, they don't care what you talk to them about. There was one, the Girl Scout leader wanted to talk about trees, for example. So it's real general. And uh, we have the Speakers Bureau, but none of the talks are geared for kids. They're, they're actually all adult talks. So uh, if any of you out there would like to talk to kids, then this would be an opportunity. OK. Liz, going to talk about outings. Welcome everyone, now that the weather is beautiful, time to get outdoors. And before I start, I just want to say, Veronica, I just want to say hi. Um, this is Veronica back here, she's actually visiting, and she's with, she's an officer in the Wisconsin, Milwaukee area Sierra Club. So welcome, we're glad to have you. Good job. outings announcements and then I'll go into the outreach. So um, just a, a little bit overview. Most or all of this information is already on our website or will be on the website within the next couple of days. So I'll just kind of give you the highlights and I'm happy to give you details after the meeting um, or, or you can look online also. Um, we did have a wonderful, <coughs> excuse me, wonderful trip to Big Bad National Park. Um, everything went as planned except for the snow the night we were supposed to leave in uh, West Texas and we ended up having to delay the trip day, but still had a wonderful time. So we appreciate everybody that participation in that. Um, as far as classes, we also did our Backpacking 101 class, had a great turnout at a new venue and those people will have opportunities for upcoming outings as well as the general public, but we have some special outings for them too. Um, the upcoming class, uh, that we have scheduled, a lot of people have been asking for, is our wilderness navigation. And this is a phenomenal class. Arthur teaches it. It's just really wonderful information so that those of you that don't know how to do anything without a phone and a GPS, you'll actually know and learn how to read a map and a compass and get out there and have the GPS for backup and for fun, but actually be able to guide yourself out in the wilderness. Uh, that's scheduled for June 10th and 11th. It's a Wednesday and Thursday night. We also have, for the spring, it's great weather. We have a variety of outings coming up. We have some really great day hikes, uh, both scenic and educational. Uh, Jim Bennings is leading those, so you can look. We've got them on schedule for April and May. Arthur's doing two backpacking uh, trips in April to Arkansas. Two different places, one's a little easier, one's a little harder. So be sure to sign up for those. All of these have limited uh, numbers. We uh, we believe in the Leave No Trace, and so we don't take a huge group. We take a group that's a, a good size for safety and for the trail. So um, if you're interested, look into it really soon. Um, I'm doing also then a tent camping, pretend beginner backpacking, at Ray Roberts Lake State Park the first weekend of May. Uh, we'll get priority to the people in the class, but well, there will be space at a group site, so there will be space for others also. And that'll be a lot of fun. So, um, oh, and also, coming up, the next bus trip is Bandelier National Monument. Uh, if you've never been, it's phenomenal. A lot of really historic scene sites, petroglyphs, all that kind of thing. We haven't been for a while because of the fire, but they went and scattered it out and found trails and the beauty back where, it, where it's regrown. Um, that's Memorial Day. The trip is already half full. Limited number, so if you're interested, sign up. Your reservation, your paperwork, and your payment is your reservation. You can't just call or email the leader and say, I'm interested. So get on that. The paperwork and everything's on our website. I think, for, as far as, oh, and then tomorrow night uh, is our monthly outings meeting. It's usually the third Wednesday of the month, but we're doing it the second Wednesday of the month um, in, April, in March. Uh, tomorrow night at Lover's Lane Central Market. Lovers and Green Lab at 6.30. So if anyone's interested, I have information on that. Okay, so those are all the outings. But you do have that uh, one to climb a meadow. In, there's one to climb a meadow in May as well. That's the educational one. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want into details on where everything okay. is. I'm just letting you know there are different ones <coughs> in April and May, the day hikes. Uh-huh. But that's good. You can watch them there. Okay. New hat. 
Um, the other thing I enjoy doing is we have Inspiring Connections Outdoors, or ICO, which as many of you know is our outreach program. We've been a little slow lately, or the last six months, because of some changes in the kids and the, the schools, the agencies we work with, but we're gearing back up. Um, some of you heard before Marcus Russell, who talked to us, two or three, who was our speaker two or three months ago, and about his organization and foundation that works with children in four different impoverished apartment complexes in South Dallas. We're working and, and getting him signed up so that we can take some of those kids out. So the whole idea is to get kids outdoors that without us would not have that opportunity. Um, we're doing a spring kickoff get together the end of the month, March 29th. I have a sign up over here. It's by the, where the brownies were. I don't know if there are any still left. Um, but on the far right, there's a little a smaller board that's more manageable. That's over there. And there's a sign up sheet, or you can come see me after the meeting, or send me an email, and I'll be sure you get that information. And I think that's it. But it's a really, really wonderful way to be involved in helping the next generation get outdoors. And it's usually just a Saturday. So kind of painless, but a lot of fun and very valuable to the, the next generation. Thank you. By the way, the fire she refers to, I'm sure you all remember that. It almost burned down Los Alamos National Labs, and it burned down a good part of Los Alamos. It started at Vandalier, where they were doing a controlled burn. And uh, <coughs> those guys have taken a bad rap because they checked the weather the way you're supposed to, and the wind came up unpredictably, unexpectedly. And that's when that fire got out of control. It ought to be interesting to see what the habitat looks like there now. Some years, I don't remember how long ago that was. Do you, Liz? Uh, no, 13. 13, so seven years ago. So by now, the habitat will have come back quite a bit. And it ought to be great for elk, because they're grazers. Are there any, is anyone here from Sunrise? Okay, that's all the announcements then. So we'll go to, well, we're gonna have committee reports, David. Okay, okay. I thought those were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would think that. <laughs> so, Chris and Dick, do you have any more you wanna add uh, in terms of the uh, Conservation Committee report? Nothing more? Okay. That first thing was just supposed to be announcements. But that's okay. We got it out of the way. So, outings. Liz, you've done everything for outings, right? Membership. Nothing more? Uh, name me another committee. <laughs> Political, we'll do that last. Well, no, we'll do programs last. Okay, okay David. Political. Committee. Hey, okay. not sure I need that, but I'll get it anyway. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. I'm David Griggs, the uh, political <coughs> chair. Most of you know that we are uh, very much involved in local, state, and national politics. Uh, we uh, just had a primary. Several of our candidates were nominated. Others of them are in the runoff. Uh, we will be letting you know closer to the election some of those uh, endorsements that uh, we'd like for you to know about. And certainly before the general election, you'll hear a lot about it. Uh, the main thing that uh, I want to show you is our website. Are you pulling that up? Uh, TurnTexasGreen.org. Uh, that's the main thing I want to mention to you. Is uh, where you can go and find out who those endorsed candidates are. And where you can uh, donate, if you would like, with a credit card. Uh, TurnTexasGreen.org is what he's pulling up now. Uh, and uh, hopefully he'll get that quickly uh, so that we can see it. Uh, that's all you have to do. Go to, to that uh, at the top. Yeah, right there. Anyway, the, the primary uh, runoff is, as you know, May the 26th, and the early voting will be the week before that. And of course, Memorial Day will take the, that day off, and, and then we'll finish the voting on May the 26th, which is a Tuesday. But here's where you can uh, go and find out who our endorsed candidates are. Uh, 2020 endorsements right there for the Texas legislature. Uh, so uh, you can click on that. 
and go up here to the donate button. That's the main thing I want them to see. Uh, obviously, because we need to raise a lot of money to help our endorsed candidates. So if you feel motivated this year to elect environmentally uh, uh, supported candidates, uh, please do that. It's PayPal. Uh, if you have a PayPal account, you can use it. If you don't, just any red your uh, credit card. And uh, you can put anything from five to $500,000 in there. Uh, Texas, we're not limited to what you can give. So uh, uh, we'll take anywhere from five to, you know, you name your, your limit. Uh, so uh, please consider that. David Griggs, political report. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well, now we'll get to the program committee co-chairs, Victoria Howard and Renee Robertson. And they will also introduce our speaker for tonight. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful, beautiful spring day. Um, Renee is actually going to do the honors of introducing our wonderful speaker tonight. But I would like to shamelessly plug next month's speaker. Um, I don't know if all of you are aware, and have been seeing on Facebook and, and different environmental sites, that there is actually a new company called Turn Composting that collects composted food waste at different Whole Foods around the Metroplex. They drive all over the place. It's a subscription-based company, and the goal of this company is to reduce food in our landfills. Now, I know most of the people here at Sierra Club are long-term composters. Our talk next month is going to go beyond that. It's going to talk about why composting is not just a great idea, how it's imperative to keep our bulk and landfills from filling out anymore. You may know that Denton is having to expand its landfill. I'm trying to find out how close we are in the Melissa Mint landfill in Collin County. It's a big deal. So please, please come out um, April 14th for Lauren Clark. She is the owner, president, creator of Churn Composty. And without further ado, my lovely co chair, here you are. Thank you. I appreciate the compliment. <laughs> uh, my name is Renee Robertson. I'm the co chair as well. And I'd like to echo her sentiments. I'm so glad that they're able to come out on the spring day. I know someone you have spring fever, you may want to stay in bed, but I'm glad you came here instead. Uh, take advantage of our refreshments. We may have had a charge of plates earlier, but we've got plates back there now. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Trinity River Audubon Center. The Audubon Center has lots of birds and all kinds of things. Uh, I went to one of their owl problem nights one night and had a really good time. But without further ado, we have the center director here, Shelly White. And as it says, this program is for the birds, Trinity River birds. So we have nothing about. like Shelly asking for the birds. <laughs> <laughs> so she, ready even, to go. she even had me shorten down her introduction, so I'm not going to rob her of that because she just wanted to talk about the wildlife. So without further ado, I'd like you to welcome Shelly White. Good evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Uh, as Renee said, I'm Shelley White. I'm the center director at Trinity River Audubon Center. Full disclosure, I have been there six months, so I will meet, need my notes for this, but if you have me back next year, I'll know everything there is to know about the center. I'm learning quickly. Um, but we're a big center. We're 120 acres, so there's a lot of ground to cover, literally and figuratively. Okay, I guess I am doing this as well, and then I have notes, so just bear with me with all my, I need an extra arm, but that may not happen tonight. Okay, so Trinity River Audubon Center, how many of you have been there? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, that's wonderful. So you probably know where it is then. We're off Great Trinity Forest Way, also known back in the day as Luke 12, for those of us. Uh, born and raised in Dallas, which I am. And we have 120 acres there. We opened in October 2008. Um, and you will see that besides the wonderful trails and everything that we've got for wildlife and outdoors, uh, we have a beautiful building that was designed by Antoine Predock. Um, very interesting building looks quite different from the outside than it does from the inside uh, and we were first the first park and rec building we are owned by the city of dallas 
but the first park and recreation building that uh, was LEED Gold certified. And so here is just a nice view. We've got the Trinity Forest, the Trinity River, 120 acres, as I've said many times. We've got five miles of trail. So everything all in one spot if you visit us. Um, this is our education wing, which is uh, a big part of our programming, and I'll get into that in further detail later. Um, but we do have 22,000 square feet of space. We do a lot of school programming there, but we also rent out for facility rentals or, or a lot of weddings. Has anybody been to a wedding event out there by any chance? No. Um, what, it's really interesting, the people who like to visit our facility for a wedding. Um, and so you were talking about composting. We have an event there in a few weeks and the bride is bringing in somebody to compost all the food at the event. So we're hoping to do that longer term and make those types of partnerships and become truly green. Um, and then ju I just have to say, this isn't about Trinity River Audubon Center, but I did meet um, an amazing person at the uh, CCAP meeting, the Dallas Climate Symposium last week, and he's with a group called Stew Pot, and they will come pick up your food and give it to the bridge and certain homeless shelters in Dallas. So um, if you want his information, um, shameless plug for him because they are doing great things and I think we all care about the waste out there. But uh, moving along, we've got permeable pavement, we've got on-site septic treatment, all of the fun things that people want to know about, I'm sure. Um, but here's a, a view from above and as you can see, the building is designed as a, a bird soaring over the property. Uh, we actually tie into the wonderful 6,000 acre Great Trinity Forest. Um, and then fortunately we are on the map uh, to be connected to the Arboretum one fine day when they get the trails going. So um, I've been working with the city of Dallas on that. Uh, for those of you who don't know me from my previous life, Bud Melton does, and he taught me everything I know. Um, I was with Trinity Strand Trail for eight years, so we built a trail along the original Trinity River, and thank you, Bud, for all your guidance uh, while I was with that organization. Um, it's still near and dear to my heart as are trails in our community and getting people out of their cars. Uh, and as if you can't tell, I like to go on tangents. So on that note, if you have a question, feel free to speak up because we are all friends here. So moving along, for those of you who may or may not know the history, uh, it was an illegal dumping site. And some of these statistics on this screen are quite scary. Um, it caught fire not once, but twice and release toxins into the air. Uh, if you want to know more about that history, um, it, it's quite sad, but fortunately we've turned it around. But I suggest you look on YouTube at the Out of Deepwood. Yeah, we tried to, for some reason it's cutting off some of our uh, verbiage there, so I'm not sure if that will help. But anyway, the Out of Deepwood movie, it's about 28 minutes long, and it gives a really good uh, recap on what happened. And really, we have our neighborhoods fight for justice to thank for having our center there. So we're the Audubon Center. And you may ask, why do birds matter? Well, they are truly the canary in the coal mine. And so as I get deeper into my talk, you're going to hear what we are using birds for and how they are huge predictors of what is going on with the climate and then what will happen to all of us one day. Um, but they're very important for our ecosystems, uh, as I said, to signal some of the things that are going on. So the Audubon organization rolls up a little bit. We are part of the Audubon Texas group, which also rolls up 
into the National Audubon Society. And so just a little bit of background on how that works. We are all divided into flyaways. Uh, Trinity River Audubon Center is part of the central flyaway. And so we are rolling up that way to our national organization, but it also helps us uh, maintain focus on what's going on in our area um, and the migratory bird paths, of course. So we do have five uh, strategic priorities for National Audubon Society, which are the coasts, as you can see, working lands, I'll get into that a little bit more, um, water, of course, bird-friendly communities, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well, and then climate, which I know we are all very interested in. And so, hmm, this is my longer, uh, presentation, so I apologize. If I start running too far, let me know. Um, and if I see anybody falling asleep, I'll know to just skip a few of these slides. So coasts, probably don't need to say too much about that. Working lands, I do want to say a few things. Um, we do have something called Audubon Conservation Ranching, and it is um, a designation for different ranches that are using uh, certain types of techniques with their cattle. And there is beef that is certified ACR, uh, and we're working with some different organizations. Our goal would be one day to you know, be in a Whole Foods or something like that. Um, full disclosure, I'm vegan, I don't eat meat, but um, you know, people do. And so let's be very wise with how we're handling the property that our cattle are on and make sure we're using good practices uh, for ranch management and for our ecosystems. Water, well, let's talk about uh, the Trinity River. So, as I think I have a very knowledgeable team here, but um, you know, more than half of Texas gets their water from the Trinity River. Houston gets their water from the Trinity River. I'm born and raised in Dallas uh, and was with a trail group. We built a trail along the original Trinity River. It's just um, near and dear to my heart. The Trinity Forest and the Trinity River, as well as the city of Dallas. But we need to work on this. Um, our Trinity River is definitely seeing some of the, um, let's say, growth in the state of Texas. Uh, I have to say this, more than 900,000 pounds of dog feces is in the Trinity River. I mean, these are things that you just don't even think about that we have to start looking at. Um, but the Trinity River is going to be extremely important as we move forward for the state of Texas. So it is one of Audubon, Texas's main goals as well, not just national. And then bird-friendly communities. So do you know about the bird friendly designation that came out recently? Do, are, how many of you are aware of that, the city of Dallas and the bird friendly designation? No one. Okay, well let me tell you a little bit about it. So uh, we partnered with Texas Parks and Wildlife, we as in Trinity River Audubon Center, partnered with Texas Parks and Wildlife, the city of Dallas, we've got Ben Sandifer on the group, we've got um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, this, the city of Dallas, I've already said, and different volunteers as well. And we submitted an application and were designated on February 11th as a bird-friendly city. Now, only four cities in the state of Texas got this. So it's a pretty big deal. Um, so there will be different uh, projects we'll be doing throughout the year. We will have different events that promote bird-friendly communities and how we can help our habitat and our birds. Um, so definitely look on the Audubon Texas website for that or you can also see that uh, the Dallas Park and Recreation Board signified uh, May 9th. It's going to be the second Saturday in May uh, as World Migratory Bird Day as well. What are the other three cities? Uh, Houston, um, and then... Surely Austin. 
Austin did not get it. <laughs> Neither did um, Cedar Hill, but they were very close, and I think they'll get it next year. That's a great question, and I knew the answer five minutes ago, but I should by the end of this discussion as well. You know how that happens? Um, there was a southern city as well, that southern Texas. Okay, so let's talk about some birds and plants. And so audubon.org native-plants if you would like to go there we have some uh, resources for you and one of the ones we like to talk about is our zip code where you can look up what type of birds are in your area what type of plants are good for those birds so we actually partnered with north haven gardens a couple of weeks ago and if anybody any of you know who jim shouse is Texas Master Naturalist. He led a talk for Plants for Birds and then did a hike out at our center. And we'll be doing some more of that programming coming up. And then also as part of, part of the Bird Friendly Community designation, there will be additional resources for doing those types of programs. Um, so we'll be talking about those on our Facebook page and event page uh, as we put those on the calendar. And then climate. Um, you know, it's, there's only so many times we can say, oh, it's Texas, the weather changes, right? I mean, it's um, pretty clear what is going on with, with our climate. So National Audubon Society came out with a report on October 10th. I've actually got some magazines. It's called Survival by Degrees. If any of you are interested, I brought them with me. And it is looking at bird species and what are happening to them um, with, with climate change. And specifically, it looks at a few different scenarios, and one is us increasing 1.5 degrees Celsius, and one is three degrees Celsius. And what you can do is type in your, this is gonna go through some, Wouldn't that be interesting if the battery just ran out, <laughs> just ran out. But it appears that may be what happened. Let me see, let me turn. There we go, thank you so much. Uh, so you can put your zip code in, and what this will do will pull up many things. Number one, you can see what's happening to the bird species in your area, what is at risk, if we increase 1.5 degrees Celsius, if we increase three degrees Celsius. Not only that, it will tell you what those risks are. So maybe it's flooding, maybe it's drought, um, but it will look at those scenarios as well. And this isn't to scare anybody, although it is quite frightening if you do this, um, but really, it's to show us that we can make a difference now and change that. And as I said earlier, the birds are the canary in the coal mine. So us tracking those birds, seeing what will happen to them, to those species, is actually showing us what will happen to us one day. Um, and so something also important that's come out of this is National Audubon Society is giving us many tools we can use on how to teach kids about this without scaring them, um, but using some examples that are applicable to them uh, without having people feel like they're going to give up hope one day. So um, we can make a change, it's doable, but after this meeting or tonight, I suggest that you all go online and check this out and you can just go to the uh, Audubon.org website and scroll down and you can see that. And again, I do have some magazines um, if you would like to take that with you as well. So let's let's turn this up. Yeah, it's I'm so sorry it is not working. So if you could advance, please. And of course, this happened when I'm about to start going quickly through these, but I appreciate your help. So Audubon, Texas. Um, we actually have three centers. I'll show you pictures of those in a minute, but we see uh, about 35,000 students and about 65,000 visitors every year. And so 
One of our centers is in San Antonio. That's Mitchell Lake Audubon Center. And then the next one, many of you may have been to Dogwood Canyon that is only 20 miles from where I am. Uh, Julie Collins is their center director. Lovely place, uh, definitely go there. And then of course we have Trinity River Audubon Center. So um, you may say, Shelly, I've been there, but if I come back, what will I see? See, this is much more interesting probably to people who haven't been there as much. So what will you see at Trinity River Audubon Center? So now these are just gratuitous pictures. Grady Hinton, one of our famous volunteers there, gets out with his camera almost every day and takes pictures. So these are bird pictures. So the Northern Cardinal, the page before, we've got the Harris' Sparrow. The next one is the American Kestrel. And this, this bird was stalked by Grady. That's all I can say. <laughs> He, he fulfilled his goal of getting pictures of that. Um, there we go, and then the Easter Phoebe. Oh, this is beaver damage. So um, just threw that in for a change of pace. You know, we are a wildlife center. We do have a beaver that is making a very comfortable home there. Um, if anybody has any suggestions on how to deal with beavers, we are um, open to that. But what we did was we took this inside and we've made a poster about it to teach people who come through, this is how a beaver works. And if you look at it up close, it literally looks like someone chiseled that away. I mean, it, it is quite amazing what these animals can do. Unfortunately, um, two other trees fell on our building and we had to get those removed. But, the beaver is hard at work. Um, again, if anybody has any ideas how we can mitigate that. Wrap your trees. Well, we. What you want to protect? Yes, there are so many. Um, we looked at that. There are so many. We looked at moving the beaver, which we've told that it really does not help that they will find their way back. Um, for those of you who have been there, almost all of you, you know we have an outdoor. Uh, aquarium and that that pump has not been working for a very long time and now we know why the beavers den has gone underneath that so um, we were able to find out what was wrong with the pump uh, <laughs> are having issues solving that problem though okay and then the next is the northern mockingbird there's another great Great shot that Grady did. And then what can you do at Trinity River Audubon Center? So I've been talking about it. We've got our five miles of trail there. Of course, you can go uh, look at the Trinity River, visit the Trinity Forest, sit in a photo blind, take pictures of birds. Just relax and meditate, which is what I like to do. And then I had to throw in a colorful picture because I know all of these pictures look dreary. To me, I think they look beautiful, but a lot of people want to know, what does it look like in the spring? So there I have some pretty flowers for you, some of the wildflowers that we have on our property. And then this was actually taken by our operations manager. It actually looks like uh, a professional photo. Um, but you can also watch the sunrise and set at our center. So, but what were, will other people do at the center if I bring them? So let me tell you a few things we've got going on. We've got our eco-investigations and our nature talks. And let me tell you, so I, I believe you're looking for doing some, some programming for kids. It's the best, especially the nature talks. Those are our pre-K um, kids, and they have never seen an animal, many of them. And all I can say is, Kids say the darndest things. <laughs> really interesting to watch them. But I have told my uh, team that anytime the Nature Tots program is going on, I want to be there. It's so much fun to watch. But we also have eco investigations. And so we see about 17,000 school kids a year. Um, DISD, Garland, all of the school districts um, bring their schools out. 
We do a pond sampling where they get to look at uh, what is in the pond and we tie it into the habitat. They get to do a guided hike where we follow that through with the habitat and how things look at the center. And then also um, an animal encounter. We have our turtle Sheldon that is very popular. And uh, for most of these kids, it's the first time they've touched an animal. And it's so interesting to see them be very shy. They're not sure what to do. They may, you know, literally just touch touch Sheldon's back. But by the end of the day, they're wanting to hold him. They want to go outside and find their own turtle, which sometimes we have to work on that. But um, you know, seeing these kids being exposed to what is out there and that nature is not scary, which I think, you know, somebody who, some of us who have grown up in parks, it's one thing, but, but think if you just haven't been outside that much. So those are some of our programs. We also have our Audubon conservation leaders and our treks. Our conservation leaders are, we have about 50 young ladies, high school age throughout the state of Texas who we do one conservation project with them each month, and then it accumulates in a big camping trip at the end of the year. Something we have coming up for them at the end of March is we have a panel of women environmentalists. So it could be photographers, it could be, we have someone from the city of Dallas stormwater department, we have environmental lawyers, and the ladies get to, um, the young ladies get to ask them questions and really help prepare a path for them moving forward in conservation work. And then our treks is also high schoolers. We have a treks trip going on right now. We have a second one planned for next week where they take the kids out for five days and they learn how to be a team player how to be a leader. Some people naturally establish themselves as leaders. How to camp out, how to wash your clothes if you need to, how to cook your food. Um, oh, okay. and then now here are some of our events that we have coming up. So we of course have early morning burning every Saturday at 7.30 a.m. We do have a guided nature hike on Sunday, March 29th, although I heard in your announcements, it sounds like you've got another event that day, but that's at 2 p.m. Um, we have our sustainable sustainability living fair Saturday, June 6. That's also Nat uh, National Trails Day. Please come out. We have 11 vendors. It, everything from composting to natural coffee, different things to do, different programs throughout the day. I'd love to see you there. It will be from 10 till 2. Um, and then I talked about those North Haven Garden events. We have more of those coming up, so stay tuned on that. Um, the Master Birding Program, they actually do the training on site. They'll be meeting monthly um, starting in September through May. And then let's, let's hope EarthX is going on, you know, that we'll still have that event. We will be out there. Please feel free um, to come by. We will have two screens where you can put in your zip code, one to do the plants for birds, and want to do the survival by degrees. And so this is just general information about our center. So we're open every day from 9 to 4, Monday through Friday. And then on Saturdays, we open early, um, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then Sundays, 11 to 5. Um, and then here's our prices. Residents of 75217 are always uh, Ticket list, they can come anytime they want. And then the third Thursday of each month, we also do a free general admission for everybody else. And then facility rentals are available if you're looking for a cool spot to do your uh, event as well. And that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> This is my contact information. I also have business cards in the back, but I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Yes, I see a hand back there. Uh, I'm not from Dallas, so yes. where is your center? Yes, it is, if you are in downtown Dallas, we are a mere eight minutes from downtown Dallas. We, if you go down 45, it's in the southern part of Dallas. So if you know. I'm in Cedar Hill. Wonderful. We are about 20 miles from Cedar Hill, 
And if you are in Cedar Hill, you may also, if your time is limited and you can't get to our Audubon Center, you may want to try the Dogwood Canyon Audubon Center. It's right there at the Cedar Hill Preserve Park, and it's a gorgeous location as well. Feel free to hike around there. We're all friends. Yes? Um, does the Audubon Center have anything for, for like butterflies? I'm so glad you asked that. Thank you. And I left that out of my presentation, but I will be adding it. We are actually working on a pollinator garden right now. So we had a butterfly garden. Um, it's, it's gotten a little uh, aged, and so we have Jim Shouse. We, we use Texas Master Naturalists, our, our amazing volunteers, and they help us so much. And he is overseeing that project to redo that butterfly garden, and we have a landscape architect who has been working on that. So we are hoping to get that going in the spring, get everything planted we need, and uh, keep up with us on Facebook. Hopefully we'll have some great uh, pictures to share and uh, progress to report. Yes? Uh, news reports about the decline in the number of birds in uh, North America, I believe, is like two billion or is that worldwide? Well, I, the, I heard a little bit more than that. If you're talking about, was it, was it Harvard that came out in the fall with that? And it was actually right before our uh, October 10th uh, release of Survival by Degrees. But, um, it's, we need to address some of the things that are going on with our environment right now. Um, unfortunately, there have been some changes. And if you, I can't speak to that. We weren't part of that study, so I cannot confirm that. However, I will say, if you want to look at the National Audubon Society information, it is all backed by science. They have been working on this. They came out with a report in 2014, so they have been working on this for six years to make sure that it was valid, relevant, and backed by science. So uh, let me give you one of those uh, magazines before I leave today. You might find that of interest. I, well, I was going to say, uh, oh, I thought sorry. the number one uh, cause for immediate uh, bird decline was uh, cats. I knew you were going to say that. That is um, a touchy subject with some. So, uh, they're going to keep the cats in the <laughs> mm -hmm. So, that is something that we are working on with the city of Dallas for bird friendly communities. Mm -hmm. Is um, working on people uh, bringing their cats indoors. But uh, I will not confirm or deny that. <laughs> beehives so we actually have a few we had a few beehives they have been uh, we had someone managing that and they're supposed to come back out and look at it we're actually selling the honey that we've got the honey to sell in our store um, but they we're trying to get that ranked up you know the center we have been focused on a few other things throughout um, the past couple of years. And so now that I am there, we're looking at getting some of these programs back up and really paying attention to some of the things that maybe were, were not so much neglected, but just were not priority at that time. So um, yes, I want bees, I want butterflies, I want it all. So we are working on that. Yes. There was a very good study done at the University of Wisconsin about predation on birds, and it isn't only birds, by the way, it's also native mammals. The cats kill more birds than all natural predators combined. So sooner or later, Audubon's gonna have to step up and take a position and tell people, at least you can tell people, especially the kids, because they'll tell their parents, Mom, we got to keep our cat inside, not let it roam around at night. By the way, we have a big coyote population in Addison, where I live, and coyotes love cats. They make a real nice meal for coyotes. Uh, you don't, you're not doing a cat a favor, you know, when you let it roam around at night. Now, the feral cats is a different situation. Well, I think the feral cats are part of the problem. Well, they are, but people can't keep a feral cat inside at night because they're feral. You can keep your cat, your domestic cat, 
You're right. Inside. They cannot, uh, they cannot set the cats free because they don't want to take care of them. They can take them to shelter or something like that. That's, a, that's a huge, in rural areas, that is a huge problem. Yes. Um, I was, uh, I don't know if it's the collar or a muscle or something that house cats can't catch birds. Does anybody hear about that? Or it's a I'm writing that down. Called the bell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I need the bell. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, they were saying because they had the same problem. And uh, <coughs> someone invented it. And if you own a house cat and put it on, your, your cat can go out, but it can't catch birds. Yes. I hadn't heard of that, but thank you. Well, the bell on a cat is hundreds of years old. Yeah. Well, no, it, 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 it's not just More a little tinkly bell. It's something else that would have to be prevented from. Do you, know, do you know what it was? No, but it's called Make them wear a cone. Oh, a cone. But the article was Any other questions? First of all, most birds are killed during the day. Not that many birds are active at night. Yeah. So, and the ones that are are going to eat the cat. Instead of a cat eating the cat. But the, a bell would be a good idea. Just a little tinkly bell. If you could get people to do it. I don't know. I was blaming the feral cats on the... Uh, pile of dove feathers I kept finding in my backyard until I saw the hawk take the dove. We have owls too. And hawks. Yeah, you know what? I'm sitting here watching this and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Audubon I apologize can, to the cats. <laughs> Audubon could give away little cat belts. <laughs> As a star, as I'm sure people will be lining wall. up outside our door <laughs> for that. But we well, never know. And we'll, we'll be working on a few things with this bird-friendly community. This, I think the city of Dallas needs to be involved in this discussion because it is a citywide issue. Yes? So with 120 acres of property, has the, uh, has the Audubon uh, Center ever decided like if they might make like, uh, like, like campgrounds uh, uh, accessible? We, we had those at one point. Um, that I have now learned that there has to be certain um, regulatory guidelines, uh, not so much licensing, but by the city of Dallas that might prohibit us from doing that, but we are looking into that again. We don't have that. Um, licensing isn't the right permit right now. But I hope we do on down the line because it's a really great place to camp out. And we have outdoor bathrooms, so it makes it really easy as well. So we're working on that. We have a lot of things in the works, programs in the works. So, um, you know, I'm six months in, but let's check with me in another year, and I hope to be saying yes to all of those programs you're asking about. Yes? Uh, do you have a hosting of what birds are coming through and uh, coming by your site. It's actually on our front desk. So if you come in, we'll give you a trifold that has some of that. And then our amazing uh, volunteer, Brady, whose pictures I've used, he just put together a photo <coughs> for us. But it's it actually resides on Do you have of, a like, bird alert for certain unusual sightings and things like that? Not at this time, but that's a great suggestion well, Audubon, to do that. Audubon Society does right. birds and bird alerts, so just go to Audubon. Well, but I'm saying they have a they have a, a, a mm -hmm. area, a small area, right? And quite that's often, right. when you have that, people those people will put up notices. So birders that you know they're lifeless, they may not have seen something that's coming through, or that something that's out of its normal. A flyway or whatever, and, and so that, those, you know, get people to go to those sites. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. I think we have a number of Audubon groups in this area. Yes. Each one of them have websites, and they do have on the websites, or at least at their meetings, they do have exactly that information. The bird sightings. They, they'll tell you that the group has seen the White Rock Lake or something like that. But they well, have like a very timbers, which I'm a member of, Dallas. Uh, <laughs> Each one of them will have uh, information that you're asking about. So I was asking about there specifically, if they posted that, <coughs> it would be interesting to burgers. Oh, I see. I got one, one more. <laughs> yes. Um, which I've totally forgotten. This young lady. Is the Audubon Society on the flyway for the, um, the cranes, the uh, sand dunes? I know they stopped in Nebraska. So, this isn't going to work. If you go to that, let me see here, if it's even on there with our flyaways. We do break down what is going through each flyaway. Um, I don't know if it's on what I brought here, but so it's interesting. The, we're in the central flyaway. But Mississippi is where some of that comes through. So our coasts are considered, this is confusing, on the Mississippi flyway for that reason. Um, Sandhill cranes winter on the Texas coast, and they fly over here on their way north. Whether they stop or not, I don't think very much, because they just start from the so Texas coast. So if you go back coast. one more, that'll show. Oh, no, those, are, those aren't bird species in there. I thought that was bird species. Um, you know, the hooping cranes, back when they used to make a big deal of the, how many few of them there were, uh, they used to come to the Dallas, the FW area. Can you speak up just a bit? Oh, the hooping cranes used to come through the They still do. The area. They still go over. They don't mention it well, on Well, I think y'all can teach me a few things about birds, <laughs> so I may need to take your class. Yes? I was wondering, you talked about, I believe it was the 352 different bird species that are affected by climate change. Could you talk a little bit about if any of those are in North Texas, and also what is the current air quality and pollution that we have in the Dallas area doing to the bird population here? So it's 389. 389. Um, but, you know, I, we had a write-up on Texas and what that looked like, and I do, interestingly, pollution wasn't one of the big ones for that. But it is losing some of our wetlands mm -hmm. and some of our prairies, and um, I mean, we can all see it. Everything is budding early. And then the birds come through and they are not getting what they need to survive the trip back home. But let me see I'm, if I can find that online. I'd love to share that with you. The actual, it's, it's a lengthy report, but I think you may find it of interest where they just look at Texas alone. That would be fascinating, yes. The beaver might not be all bad. They certainly would make you some nice weapons. He is forging a path all through our property right now. <laughs> you are correct about that. Um, I remember what I'm going to ask you. The, uh, the migration. Uh, climate change is changing the phenology of bird migrations when they come, when they leave, and so on. As you said, they get to a place too early because of climate change. They don't have the resources. You have... Uh, do you have a program where people record the first sighting of migrating species on your area? We keep a list, but it's not that detailed. But that's probably a great idea that we could start keeping up with that. And of course, we have, you know, people go online and, and log things mm -hmm. online. But we don't have a program specific to Trinity River Audubon Center for that, besides the fact that we get a lot of knowledgeable birders there who will leave notes in our notebooks that we can look through and see what is going on. That information
information on phenology is, is useful with regard to uh, climate change, documenting the impact of climate change on these migratory species. You bet, you bet. And that's one of the tools when you look at this zip code, you can see that, how things are changing and um, run different scenarios and see exactly what is impacting those bird species. Yeah. Well, do we have any more questions? Maybe one more, that'd be it. Okay. Well, thank, thank you. you. Well, we finished up uh, fairly early tonight. So before we adjourn, let me mention that uh, a bunch of people will go over to the Blue Goose on Midway to eat now. They have $2 frozen margaritas tonight. And I think the club will hit for a couple plates of uh, fancy nachos. So if you're interested in that, uh, as soon as you get away from here, go on over to the Blue Goose on Midway. It's just south of Beltline. Okay, and with that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>